Welcome to our service this morning. We are so happy that you are here. Uh, just a, first, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, the men's Bible study for Wednesday has been canceled. Are the ladies meeting Friday? Uh, the ladies, no, Bible, no Bible studies this week. And then uh, the ladies' luncheon scheduled for Friday, December 4th, has been postponed until December 11th because the restaurant over in Edmore uh, is closed <laughs> until then. And uh, the 13th of December, we are having our Christmas program. And because we're not doing a cookie fellowship or a fellowship hall, uh, we are going to be preparing some bags of cookies uh, for you to take home with you. And if you would be, if you would be willing to make some cookies, uh, please see Marilyn Beardsley. She can give you all the details of how much uh, you, we need. And uh, so uh, if you want to get in the baking mood, uh, please see Marilyn uh, uh, today or uh, next week. I think that's all the announcements we need to make. Uh, let's open our service with prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could be here today and uh, that we're back in operation after not having heat. We're thankful that the furnaces have been repaired and that we can enjoy heat in the building again. We want to remember some people uh, that are connected to our fellowship here today uh, who have been hit with the COVID, Mary Ann and Zach, and perhaps there's others who have been affected by the COVID. And we just ask for a, a quick recovery of these individuals. And I just pray that all of us would do whatever we need to do to uh, maintain uh, healthy bodies. We also uh, think of our missionary, uh, Kelly Cook, uh, that uh, she and her husband are now down in Florida awaiting a transplant. Uh, and uh, I just pray that you would be with them. Uh, we think of another missionary, David, who is having wrist surgery on Wednesday. Pray that that would go well. Thank you that uh, uh, his heart has uh, been uh, repaired and uh, uh, there's no need for a pacemaker. We pray for people who are going through struggles these days. And uh, we thank you uh, this particular time of the year when we celebrate Thanksgiving, that we do have so much for which we can be thankful. And uh, I just pray that we may never take you for granted and that we know that you are in complete charge of our lives. We pray for our nation today in the turmoil over the election. And I, I pray that uh, there would be a good resolve of that problem and that we can move forward as a nation. Bless our church today, all of our families. We, we think of those who uh, are ailing today. We think of Margaret and Avis. And I pray that you would uh, be with them in a special way today. And for Kathy, who is going through a tough time right now, and uh, I just pray that you'd surround her with your love. We commit the service to you in Christ's name. Amen. Would you please stand as we have the scripture reading taken from Psalm 37. I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice, and he does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks justice. The law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. 
May God has blessed in upon the reading of God's word. Amen. What a great promise, right? That God is always there. He, as long as we are following him, he says, no matter what this is, right? Even through times like this. Praise to the Lord. And what better reason to praise him is that he is always faithful. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul. tremble. He sits enthroned above the cherubim. The earth quakes. The Lord is great in Zion, and he is exalted above all the peoples. May they praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established order. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord, O God, and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Holy, holy, holy.
Well, good morning. Good morning. So some of us, not many, went deer hunting last week. You had a good time? It was raining. It was cold. That'll show you. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so we, obviously, the heat is working again, so praise the Lord for that. Uh, that was an odd thing. It seems like it was just a year ago we had one of our igniters go out, and uh, this year two of them went out. So, I don't know. But by his mercies, he does what he does, and he provides for us. Uh, and Janet and I were here last Sunday uh, to make sure that nobody came. So evidently we were able to get the word out well enough because nobody came uh, <laughs> because of not hearing that we had to shut down. Well, I want to extend my personal thank you to everyone who has been so faithfully uh, attending uh, since we resumed our in-person uh, services. And that's not an easy decision to make. Uh, and it, it's, it wasn't an easy um, rule or uh, safety precaution to put in place to wear the masks and to separate all the pews so that there would be the distancing and uh, that, that wasn't, that's not fun. Those aren't fun decisions to have to make. And, uh, you know, the church had to make some, and each individual has to make them uh, to decide whether or not you're going to come. But, so I thank you for coming. And, um, and those who are very strenuous in their objection uh, to not wear a mask, um, I thank them, too, for not coming, because... I mean, that could cause division, you know? I, I hate like fire not seeing them here, but they've made the choice to not be divisive uh, and, and so as to allow those who will wear the mask to go ahead and meet. And uh, boy, oh boy, I long and pray for that day when this will all be over and we will all be together again. Uh, until then, we kind of just <coughs> do the best we can uh, with the information that we have. Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, by a show of hands, uh, who we have here uh, is usually the ones that are coming regularly, who here uh, plans to attend the Christmas Eve service that we have uh, each year at 6 o'clock? I've got two, three, four, five, so okay. <coughs> then we will, we will have it. If we only had like two or three hands go up, um, I was thinking of canceling it because, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into that. You know, I have to, I'm usually the accompanist uh, on, on guitar, so that's a lot of extra work for me. Uh, we prepare communion because we like to observe that, so there's, there's a lot of things uh, that go into that service. Um, so good, I'm glad. Uh, looks like we'll have at least 10 uh, people. Okay, we are continuing on in the Gospel of John. And we're going to be looking at chapter 10, verses 22 to 42. And let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Our Heavenly Father, God, we bless and magnify your holy name. And I thank you that you have called me to be your child, to redeem me from all of my trespasses, to forgive me, and to grant me uh, the grace to be covered by the righteousness of Christ, that I might be able to stand before you, and that you would give me the promise of eternal life. And I pray that for myself and I pray that for all who are here and have called upon the name of Jesus Christ to save them. So God, we thank you. And that is one of the greatest reasons why we gather together here 
for you have ordained your church as a location uh, for people to gather together in your name to worship you. We know church is not the building. It is the people. And you have ordained us at this time and this place to be your local body right here in Stanford. And so we thank you for your call on each one of our lives to be a part of this gathering. God, as we come now and take a look at your holy word, I pray that you help us to understand it and that we would apply it to our lives and that we would be changed by it. And God, we pray that as we continue to press further into you, that it would mold us and conform us and transform us into the image of the Son, Jesus Christ, that we might be that bright light in this community, reaching out to those who have not yet received you as Savior. God, use us to be that beacon, to be that, that welcoming group that reaches out to those who are lost in their sins. And to those who did receive Christ and but are not attending a local church anywhere. God, help us be a beacon to them as well, to, to be a part of this gathering. So God, these things we pray for your glory, and in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. I'll begin with a, an illustration Have you heard the phrase, he acts just like his father? <laughs> or, or, or even, he looks just like his dad, right? You know, I, I have had, I, I couldn't tell you, I couldn't count the number of times in my lifetime, people who know me and my dad, they say, I look just like him. And then I've heard it the other way. My son, I've heard so many people just in shock saying, well, you two look exactly alike. Now, the looks category is not something we have any control over. That's all hereditary. But acts like, talks like, laughs at the same type of humor and, and uh, gets motivated by the same types of things and pursues, it's like, when I grow up, I want to be just like my dad. When you hear phrases like that, what do you suppose causes the son to be just like the father? He loves him. He's proud of him. It's more than that. The son had to be around the father a lot to be able to see what dad did, to be able to hear what dad said, to, to know how, to, how dad reacts in certain situations, to know the value system that dad has. That takes time. So you have the love, you have the being proud of, but you need lots and lots of time. And then what isn't said is you don't spend a lot of time with other fathers. Your dad is the only one that you want to take in to your eyes and to your ears, that you want to be like him and you forsake all others. This is the kind of relationship that we have between God the Father and God the Son. For all eternity past, Jesus was in close fellowship, close community with God the Father. And has always heard the things that God the Father said. Jesus always saw the things that God the Father did he knew what would make his dad angry. He knew what would 
cause his dad to melt with love. He knew all his value system, what, what motivated him to do certain things and to not do other things. Jesus was with him, not just a little bit of the time, but for all eternity past. Jesus is just like his father in all aspects. So that's what we see. That's what this passage will kind of point to is this intimate relationship between father and son. Let's look at John chapter 10 verses 22 and 23. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. Feast of Dedications. What is that? You know, we've, there, there are seven main feasts that, that the Jews observe every year. Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Feast of Weeks, then the Feast of Pentecost, uh, the, uh, Yom Kippur, which is um, the, uh, oh, it's going to escape me. Good thing I wrote it down. <laughs> I'm not Jew, so I, I don't know these necessarily all by heart. Uh, the Day of First Fruits. Day of Trumpets and Day of Atonement. That was the one I was looking for, which is um, Yom Kippur. Um, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also called the Feast of Booths, or Ingathering. Or if you know the Hebrew word, it's Sukkot. What is the festival that Jesus had just attended uh, two, two months earlier? We're being told here in verse 22 and 23 that it's winter. In chapter 10, verse 22, we are told we are now in the Feast of Dedication here in Jerusalem and that it is winter. And uh, for your information, that is uh, some, according to the Jewish calendar, um, that would be the month of Kislev. That is in November, December time frame because their months don't line up with the start and end of our month. So it's somewhere, and it changes year to year. Okay? Uh, in fact, there's only 354 days in their year, 11 days less than ours, 354. So about every three years, they actually add a 13th month. It's kind of interesting. But at any rate, uh, the month of Kislev is when the Feast of Dedication is. Two months prior to that, they were at the Feast of Booths, Sukkot. That's in the September-October frame. That began in... Chapter 7, verse 2. That's when Jesus' brothers and disciples were encouraging him to come down to the feast, the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem. There are three primary feasts in which every Jewish male is supposed to attend to make a pilgrimage every year. Now, by the first century AD, that had been uh, changed uh, since the... Uh, from the time that they returned from exile, they never really adhered to that. But there's still many people came, as you know, millions of people would uh, swell the cities of Jerusalem, uh, especially for Passover. Uh, but anyway, there's three of them, and the Feast of Booths is one of them. Let me double check that. I 
could be lying. No, that's correct. The Feast of Booths is one of them. Uh, then there's the Feast of Passover, and then the Feast of Pentecost, which is 50 days later. Okay, so at any rate, Jesus secretly went up. His brothers and his disciples wanted them, wanted Jesus to go with them for the Feast of Booths in chapter 7, verse 2. And he did not. But then he went later. After they had gone, he went secretly. Scripture tells us he went secretly to this feast. And he gets involved in all this teaching, and his teaching ends up causing a division among the Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the priests. There's, there's this division that we uh, looked at already. And then, chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus withdraws to the Mount of Olives. So now it's the night of that day where we had all those teachings. It's that night. Then the next morning, which is the second day, he comes back to the temple in the morning doing more teaching, and that's when he encounters the adulterous woman. And then later in that afternoon, he leaves the temple. Uh, that, so we're still on the second day. And on his way out of the temple, still the second day, sometime in the afternoon, uh, he heals the man that's born blind. Now that's uh, at the beginning of chapter 9. And now we come down to chapter 10, verse 22. And we jump ahead two months. Now it's another feast. That's why uh, John felt it important enough to tell us that this is now the time of the Feast of Dedication. What is the Feast of Dedication? Have you ever heard of the Feast of Lights? No? Have you ever heard of Hanukkah? <laughs> yes, I've heard of Hanukkah. That's the Feast of Dedication. Hanukkah is that celebration of the Maccabean revolt against Greece. Greece. The, the, uh, the general, the one who was put in charge over this area, a big area. This is after Alexander the Great had died young at the age of 32. And uh, the, his four generals then, after his death, divided the land into four uh, territories. And the territory that contained Jerusalem, the general, I forget his name, he actually went in to the temple and desecrated it. He put in the Holy of Holies where the covenant of the Ark is located. He set up a statue of Zeus. And then he and then he he sacrificed pigs on the altar. An unclean animal, which you're never supposed to do according to Jewish uh, law. And so he completely desecrated, made a mockery of the whole thing. And the Maccabeans, uh, over 100, I think, 30 years, they kept revolting. And, and uh, uh, Maccabees, he was successful in kicking Greece, not just out of the temple, but out of their territory. They won. They, it was an upset victory. Uh, it, it, it was not expected. The odds were greatly against them, but they persisted out of zeal for God and his temple. And then uh, by a miracle that's claimed, if you read Maccabees at all, um, they, their oil had gone out, but they prayed and they prayed that the oil for the lamp that is supposed to burn 24 hours a day inside the temple, they prayed that and it never went out, though they had no more oil to put in the lamp. It went for eight days. Thus, the Feast of Dedication lasts eight days. That's why they call it the Feast of Lights, because their lamp never went out by the grace and miracle of God. That's the Feast of Dedication. So this was added uh, around three to 400 BC. Uh, am I getting that wrong? Check that. Somewhere between 150 and 350 BC. Um, my memory is failing me here. 
At any rate, the, the, the Jewish people decided that they were going to create their own feast, their own festival to celebrate that and to commemorate the remembrance of that. This was not given to them by God in Scripture. They came up with this one. Same thing as uh, uh, Purim, you know, with uh, Queen Esther. Uh, that's another feast that the Jews decided to institute. Nevertheless, this is the feast that's going on, and Jesus is there. And then we come to verse... Uh, 24. Now, he's in the temple again, but it specifically talks about him being in the portico of Solomon. Portico is just essentially a, a, a big open covered porch, you know, like a gazebo. Uh, doesn't look anything like a gazebo, but you can think in terms of that, only it's huge. So this is a big porch with a ceiling of uh, that was erected by Solomon and in his honor. And this is where he is, probably because it's a little warmer under there than out in the open in the temple. So it's mentioned. So this is where Jesus is. And we come to verse 24. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So two months later, might be some of the same Jews, might be a whole new crowd, don't know. Again, most every Jewish male is mandated to attend the Feast of Booths. They are not mandated to attend the Feast of Dedication or Hanukkah. So uh, any of the Jews that aren't Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and priests that live in Jerusalem, any of the Jews that John is referring to here, there, there might be a whole new mix, okay? And so he just points out that they gather around Jesus, which is typical, and they just want to know. They kept prodding him, saying, enough with, with all of your innuendos and your parables. Tell us plainly, are you him? Are you the Christ? Now, if that's all we had to go on, we might actually think that they're anxiously awaiting the answer, the hope, the fulfillment of their prayers that Messiah had come. But they're not. This is just another one of their traps. And Jesus knows it. So Jesus does not give them a straight answer. Later, uh, in a different gospel, when Jesus is standing before Pilate and being grilled by Pilate, he is asked, do you not hear what they're saying about you? Are, are you the Christ? And he answers in very simple terms, it is as you say, I am. And uh, you will soon see uh, the Son of Man ascending and descending uh, from heaven and so but here he does not answer plainly even though that's what they want and how does he answer look at verse 25 Jesus answered them I told you if you are the Christ tell us plainly he says I told you and you do not believe the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Essentially what we have in verse 5 is Jesus says, I told you and I showed you. I told you, I showed you. There's your answer. I've already given you the answer. I've told you before and I've showed you. How did he tell us? They might ask. How and when? What did you say to give us the answer that we're asking you? Well, it's in the seven I am statements. Jesus tells them plainly seven times. Eight, actually. 
Um, but the eight doesn't necessarily qualify because there's no um, accusative object that he refers himself to. What are the, the seven? First one is, I am the bread of life. I have told you who I am. I am the bread of life. That's in John 6, 35. That is accompanied very closely with the fourth sign that shows Jesus to be the true manna, the true bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. The second I am statement is, I am the light of the world. That's in John 8, verse 12. Jesus is the light that comes blistering through, shining brightly into a sinful and dark world. He's the light that breaks all that apart and, sh and, and shows uh, truth for what truth is and sin for what sin is. Light of the world is number two. Number three, he says, I am the door. See what I mean by the accusative object? I am something. He compares himself with something. Bread of life, light of the world. I am the door. That's in John 10, 9. We just looked at that not long ago. And by it, he tells us that if we want to enter into God's presence, we need to go through the door. We need to go through and by the way of Jesus. He is the door for us to be able to have righteousness to be, uh, and stand before God the Father. The fourth I am statement is, I am the good shepherd. We looked at that two weeks ago. That's in John 10, 11, just two verses after he says, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the one who will transform you and mold you and care for your very souls. I am the good shepherd. I will train you up in the right way and lead you on the right path. I am the good shepherd. The fifth I am statement has not happened yet. And the sixth and the seventh have not happened yet. He will say to Martha and Mary, I am the resurrection and the life. That's in John eleven twenty five. Jesus will bring the dead to life. What he does physically, he is showing us what he will do for us spiritually. He will bring the dead to life. I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, that's, yeah, in uh, John eleven twenty five. In John 14, 6, he gives us the sixth I am statement. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. He is the only way to God. He is the only truth that will get us to the right place. He is the only way. He's the only provider of spiritual, eternal life. And then the seventh one is, I am the true vine. The true vine. Meaning there are lots of other vines out there. When he says, I am the good shepherd, there are lots of other shepherds out there that claim they know the way, the truth and the life. But there is only one good shepherd. There's only one door. There's only one resurrection and life. There's only one way, truth and life. There is only one true vine. And by that, in John 15, verse 1, he is telling us that he is the source and the foundation for our very souls. The seven I am statements. If you are the Christ, tell us, Plainly, I told you, and you did not believe. The eighth one, where there is a very definitive, and perhaps the granddaddy of them all, is in verse John 8, 58, which he has already said, when he said, before Abraham was born, I am. Notice there's no accusative object after that. Just I am, a clear reference to what God himself said to Moses uh, in the burning bush. I am. When, when your people, when, when I go back to Egypt and they ask me, who is it that sent me? Tell them I am sent you. So when Jesus said, 
before Abraham was born, I am. He's literally saying, I am God. But it's not just that he told them, because he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, these testify. Notice how, first of all, he says, my Father's name. I'm not doing them in my name, but aren't you Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Aren't you God? Yes. But I have spent so much time, and I have so much love for, and I'm so proud of God the Father, that I want to be just like him. Everything I hear him say, everything I see him do, that's what I do. They're that close. Their fellowship is that intimate that in essence, they are one and the same. He's just like his father. So he also says then, uh, I'm doing these works in my Father's name. These testify of me. So I've told you and I've showed you. What, have, what has he showed us? The seven signs that are recorded in the book of John. In John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, the first sign, he changes the water into wine thus establishing that he is Lord of true cleansing. Remember those big stone jars that held 25 to 30 gallons of ceremonial water for cleansing for various functions that you would have to do to ceremonially clean you so that you would be clean coming to God. Superseded. No longer necessary. It's been changed to wine. What does the wine represent? Wine in scripture, if it's not referring to actual wine itself, is a direct reference of Christ's blood. It's Christ's blood that will cleanse you. I am Lord of cleansing and providing righteousness before God. That's the first sign. He is telling them that I am the Lord. Only the Messiah can do that. Second sign, when he healed the royal official's son. That's found in John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. He shows through that sign that he is Lord and that his word, his spoken word, carries just as much power as God the Father's word when he spoke creation into being. Let there be lights. And Jesus said to this royal official, go, it will be done for you, just as you have asked. The third sign, he heals the paralytic at the pool there in the temple of Jerusalem, or, or near the temple, not at the temple, but near it, in Jerusalem. And that's found in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 18. And in that, he shows that he is Lord of the Sabbath, it's there that he gives us instructions such as that man was not created for the Sabbath to follow all of its rules and restrictions, but the Sabbath was created for man. That's the way I wrote and established this law, and I am Lord even of that. So let me blow your minds, uh, those of you who are so stringent in obeying every letter of the law, I'm going to heal somebody. And then I'm going to tell him to pick up his mat and walk, something that is not permissible to do on the Sabbath. He can walk, but he can't carry his mat. And Jesus says, go. Pick up your mat and walk. Jesus shows himself through that sign to be Lord of the Sabbath. And then also, he's Lord over human health. Who else can do that? The, the fourth sign is when he fed the 5,000 with five loaves, of bread and two fish. He multiplied those and fed 5,000 men. Could have been as many as 10 or 15,000 people by the time you add women that were following and children. Uh, but 5,000 men, that's found in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. He shows that he is 
Jehovah Jireh, he's Lord of provision. He provides what is necessary for uh, survival. And he shows that he is also the true manna, the true bread from heaven. And it's just after that, also in John chapter 6, but verses 15 through 25, that he walks on the water. He had sent the disciples on out ahead of him uh, in boats going at nighttime on the water and he stayed behind to pray and then he goes walking on the water meets them out on the water and by that he is showing that he is Lord over nature he did not sink he has command over the, the waters the wind and the waves all died down and those two, the fourth and fifth sign, the feeding of 5,000 and the walking on the water, th these are the antitypes. Anti what is an antitype? When you look in the Old Testament, everything in the Old Testament is a type that's even called out in Romans when Paul says uh, Abraham was a type or, or uh, Adam was a type that would be fulfilled in Christ, who is the antitype. The type is a foreshadowing of what's to come. The, the type is a, uh, an imperfect representation of the glorious object that is to come. When the Jews were wandering in the desert for 40 years, they were provided life-sustaining food from heaven every morning on the ground except the Sabbath for 40 years. For 40 years, they lived in an unthinkable miracle that kept them alive. Manna is sacred. It, it is so special in their religion that God even had them take some of that manna and put it in a jar and it's placed in the Ark of the Covenant that's kept inside the Holy of Holies. That's how important the manna is. And Jesus comes down and says, manna, forget that. I'm the true bread from heaven. That was just a type. I'm the fulfillment. I'm the real thing. And then with the, the walking on the water, well, the type was when God parted the Red Sea, stacked up the waters on both sides so that the Israelites could walk through as if on dry ground. And so as not to confuse that with some creative way of describing some weird but natural phenomena that might cause that, it also decided to say that Egyptian soldiers decided to follow after them. And then the waters piled back on top of them and killed them all. It was a supernatural act. It was as if walking on water. It was showing deity. Mother Nature has nothing on God. And God stacked up, heaped up, I think it puts it in the King James Version, water on both sides piled up and they walked through this huge tunnel. And that was just a foreshadowing of the glory that was to be filled by Christ as he comes walking on the water. See, that's even better than having to move the water on both sides so that you can walk through it. Jesus walks on top of it. He doesn't even have to part it. I'll just walk on top. Imagine what the Egyptian soldiers would have thought had they seen, uh, you know, nearly two million <laughs> Hebrews walking on the water to the other side. I don't even think they would have tried to, to follow them. So Jesus is the perfect fulfillment. He is the antitype. He's the perfect. And the things in the Old Testament are just types. And there's two things in two different signs uh, that John shows us and by it 
they testified that yes, he is indeed the son of the living God. He is the Messiah, the one that they was promised and that they've been looking for for so long. The sixth sign was when he heals a man born blind. We just looked at this. That's found in John chapter 9, verses 1 through 41. He shows that once again, because this was done on the Sabbath, that he is Lord of the Sabbath, but he's also Lord over sin. Because the disciples asked when they first saw this man born blind, who sinned? Him or his parents? No, well, neither one of them sinned. This was done so that the glory of God might be manifested before you. And then the seventh sign, which is yet to come, uh, which we'll begin to start taking a look at next week, Lord willing, uh, is when he raises Lazarus from the dead. That's in John chapter 11, uh, verses 1 through 46, and he shows that he is the Lord and caretaker of eternal life, not even death can prevent it. And I don't like the way these verses are broken out here. Jesus answered them in verse 25, I told you, and you did not believe. Then there's a semicolon. I would almost wish that they had ended verse 25 right there. I told you, and you do not believe. End of verse. Verse 26, I would pick up from there. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. I would... See, again, verse numbers, chapter chapters, chapter headings, these are not all uh, inspired and infallible. These were added by man to help us so that I could tell you, please turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Imagine if there were no chapters or no numbers. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful that somebody did this, but unfortunately, it... it gets us to, to think of things boxed in by verses. And we, we ought not do that. So <clears throat> on the one hand, he is say, Jesus is telling them, I told you and you do not believe. And then on the other hand, he says, I showed you and you do not believe. It's very simple. He's giving them the double whammy. He, he is emphasizing the fact that I told you and I showed you and you don't believe. I told you in seven I am statements, even in eight, I showed you by seven signs and you do not believe. Verse 26, but you do not believe. Why? Here's why. Because you are not of my sheep. <laughs> but I want to be of your sheep. He says, my sheep hear my voice. The son spends so much time with the Father and with no other fathers that he hears everything God says. He gets to know his voice. I hear his voice. We, the sheep, everybody go, bah. <laughs> we, the sheep, are to follow Christ. And we are to know his voice. The only way to know his voice is to spend a lot of time with him. And then he says, and I know them. I can't do this, the feeling of this justice. Imagine if for some reason you found yourself in a strange place where you didn't know anybody. You were told to go there. 
And it's something you wanted to do, such as like the, the very first time you were sent to, uh, to take an out-of-state class or, or course or seminar or something. And you're the only one from your office that, got, that gets to go. And you don't know anybody. You don't even know if you're in the right place. You know, you might know you're in the right building, but you don't know where in the building to go. And isn't it comforting when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I know you, you are so-and-so from this office in Michigan, aren't you? And you go, oh, thank you. Somebody knows me, at least a very little bit of me, but now I don't feel lost anymore. Now I don't feel confused or scared anymore. I'm not wondering if somebody's looking and pointing at me. Look at that silly person. They're lost and confused. It's so wonderful to have Jesus say that he knows us. You know, I, I, I think I did this once before here uh, in reference. I'm going to do it again. That, that very successful, though not necessarily recommended, sitcom Cheers. The opening theme song to go to a place where everybody knows your name. It was I am convinced that it was that theme song that they played through I don't remember how many years. Nine, I think, seasons. The only reason they lasted so long is because they always stuck to that that made you feel home, made you feel welcome. And Jesus is saying. I know them. I know my sheep. And then he says, my sheep, and they follow me. How do you know if you believe him? How do you know if you are one of his sheep? Because you hear and know his voice. Because he knows you and calls you by name. And because you follow. Are you following Are you being like the son has demonstrated to us with his father, God the father, spending all his time with him, knowing everything about him, knowing what he says, how he says it, what he does, why he does it. And he emulates him to the point that nobody can distinguish them apart. You are just like your father. You look just like your father. Do you know Jesus that well? How do we get to know him that well? One is you're doing it right now. God tells us to become involved, entrenched in one of his local churches. He calls you to which one, and then you stay there and you sit under godly, biblical-oriented and founded preaching. You're doing it right now. That's one of the things you do week after week after week. Why do we do it once a week? Well, because that's the pattern we had from the Old Testament. That's the pattern we have from the synagogues. That's the pattern we have. We follow. We are in an outbirth from Judaism. We don't disregard Judaism. They birthed us. They birthed Christianity. We are not all that different except in points of doctrine, specifically who Jesus was and that we, that we are forgiven of our sin once and for all. There's no longer a need, as Hebrew puts it, for uh, a continuing atonement from sin. I'm gonna stop there. The point is, Jesus calls us, and we are to follow. And we need to press into him so hard, so firmly, and so consistently that we take on his shape, which is just another way of saying that we know his word. We read it. 
We study it. We come together to help each other grow in our faith. We come together so we can worship God together as he has commanded. And we come together so that we can be a witness to our community and through missionary support to the world abroad. These are the threefold purposes. There are no other. We are not a country club. We are, we are not a co-op where we can get services cheaper if we band together. We're not a credit union. We're not a, a bowling alley. We are a church, and our threefold purpose is to come together to worship God together. To come together to help and encourage one another to continue to grow and be strengthened in your faith. And together to be that witness, to invite others in our community to come and see Jesus for themselves. Father, I thank you so much for your word. We thank you for this passage in John. And I thank you for the faithfulness of your people and pray that you would bless them, that you would encourage them, that you would continue to shine your presence and your peace and your fire into their life that they might continue to grow, to show themselves that they are your sheep, that we are your children, and that we want to be just like you. Be with them this week, God. May you be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, happy Thanksgiving. It's coming very close. In response to passage of scripture that we just considered, let's stand as we close with, O come, let us adore him. Oh, 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 adore him. Christ the Lord. And as board chairman, I want to add my uh, wishes for you to have a blessed Thanksgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, we can adore your name, and I just pray that as we consider you, that we would say, O oh, come, let us adore him. Dismiss us with your blessing, in Christ's name, amen. You are dismissed. Amen.